Welcome to Entrepreneurs International Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. This evening, Dan Janelle is training us on how to get more clients by writing a book. Dan, I've got a few questions that will help us get to know you at a personal level. Firstly, what is your favorite way of relaxing? Oh, great. Um, super. Uh, you might see some guitars in my background. So that might be the giveaway answer. So I play the guitar and I'm actually working at my work desk right now. So this is kind of like a, a great stress reliever or a great way to start thinking. I can just easily turn her away around from my computer, pick up my classical guitar or my 12 string guitar and start playing around or fiddling around and just relaxing and let my mind wander. So if you're wondering if I'm any good, well, I'm really not. But if you go to Amazon and you look for music by Dan Janelle, you'll find a professionally produced classical album of 16th century classical music by none other than Dan Janelle. However, that happens to be some guy in Czechoslovakia who happens to have my exact crazy name. So who would ever think that? <laughs> I certainly didn't. But I'm sure he's, uh, he's probably as uh, thrilled with having my name as, uh, as well, I take that back, I'm being facetious here, because I've been on the internet since 1994, you know, at the beginning of time. So I have maybe thousands and thousands of listings. So if you look up Dan Janelle on Google, you won't find this classical guitarist for like pages and pages and pages. He's buried, man. But on Amazon, he'll come up first for classical music for guitar. So that's not me. Uh, I listened to a couple of clips uh, for free. He's actually really, really good, but uh, I don't hold a candle to him. So thanks for asking, Roger. Bet you didn't expect that answer. What uh, fun fact would you like us to know about you? And your answer to this might, if you like, be a little shorter than your first answer. <laughs> sure. Well, I was actually a cover boy. Here I am uh, on the cover of Baseball Magazine. That, that's me sitting next to one of my high school buddies, four rows in back of the Mets dugout, the visiting dugout in Shea Stadium, way back when we were in college. So I'm a cover boy. Wow. And next, you're going to tell me you're a male dancer, but I doubt it. Third, <laughs> no. third question. What, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> what item on your bucket list excites you the most? Traveling. It'll be nice to travel again, you know? We've been cooped up for a long time. It'll be really, really nice to travel. And your favorite, and um, the destination that's, uh, that's number one for you? Well, Roger, you'd be thrilled to know that it would be Ireland. Haven't been oh. to Ireland, been to England, would be thrilled to go to Ireland and see the rugged coast and the, uh, all the wonderful things there are to do in Dublin. So there and, you go. Uh, check in with me before you go and I'll give you a few travelers tips. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. Participants, uh, this is for you. Uh, please type your questions into the chat and I'll pose them to Dan during his talk. Now you're going to be sent a link to the recording of Dan's uh, workshop in a few hours, but I encourage you to take notes anyway, because the very act of taking notes is going to increase what you absorb uh, by as much as 30%. Then, are you ready to wow us? Let's rock and roll. Okay, stage is all yours. Take her away. Okay, great. First of all, can everyone see my screen? Can you see the, the, the slide that says get more clients with a book? I certainly can. Okay, great. Want to make sure we're in the right spot because technology is uh, can throw us curveballs from time to time. So thank you. Well, I'm delighted to present uh, this session with you today. You're going to learn how to get more clients with the book. And uh, here's my agenda. You're going to leave this session realizing how a book will help you get business. You're going to discover how to get organized so you can write your book without having writer's block and you're going to learn how to overcome your limiting beliefs that prevent you from writing, and a whole lot more. So our game plan today, first, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about me. Uh, I'm gonna show you why you must write a book. Then I'm gonna share seven myths that people have told me stop them from 
writing their books. And you probably have a lot of these same questions. And I also encourage you to type more questions into the chat. We'll have time for questions at several points during the presentation today. And Roger will read questions that are relevant on each slide as well. So don't hold back, ask questions whenever you get the urge, uh, because I'm here for you. I could talk for 24 hours about this, <laughs> uh, but we only have one hour. So I want to be here and give you the content that you actually need at the level that you actually need it. So please do ask questions. No question is too dumb. No question is too silly. Please ask any questions. So we'll talk about those seven myths. Then we'll talk about three ways to get off to a fast start. And some of you will wonder how you can work with me. So I'll explain how we can do that as well. So first, you're probably wondering a little bit more about me and my story. Well, you know, my background was uh, was a journalist, and then I became went into high tech. I went into high tech as a PR person, and I was pretty successful. I introduced the CD-ROM industry to the world. Uh, I I worked with computers at the very beginning of the computer era, and I would go to software uh, trade shows to get my clients. You know, I'd deliver a speech, or I'd be on a panel, or I'd do some kind of training. And at the end of the training, people would come up to me and they said, hey, you're really smart. And I said, well, thank you very much. He said, you know, we'd like you to do our PR. And I said, great, when do we start? They said, well, you know, why don't you send us a proposal? Because we're talking to a bunch of other people. So, you know, has that ever happened to you? I mean, you're at the top of your game. You might be the best realtor in town or the best insurance agent in town. You might be in the million dollar club. You might have tremendous credentials. You might have done wonderful things, but yet, your prospects treat you like a commodity because other people have done exactly the same things that no matter what level. Um, so that's the way I felt. So I'd go back to my office and say, oh, wow, this is great. They asked me for a proposal. And I'd spend like 10, 20 hours writing a proposal, thinking of great new ideas, wonderful uh, story ideas and wonderful strategies and tactics to help these people. And I'd send it in and then I'd hear crickets. You know, you call them up, they want you to turn your phone call. And I knew it was a good proposal, but you know, they had 10 different proposals to choose from. So they really treated me like a commodity, even though I'd done wonderful, wonderful things and had great reputations and wonderful testimonials, just like all of you. And so I, I hope you can all, all empathize with that, that no matter how good you are, your prospects see you as one of a dozen. Uh, you need a way to stand out. That's the way I felt. So before the next software publishers conference, I thought, what can I do to stand out? And I said, well, I know I'll write a book. Maybe a book will help me. So what did I know about? Well, I knew how to publicize high-tech products and services. So that was the name of my first book. So I went to the next software publisher show and I did my training session and I held up my book and I said, you know, I wrote this book. And at the end of this session, people came up to me and they said, oh, we'd like you to do uh, our PR. And I said, oh, do you want me to write a proposal? And they said, no, you wrote the book. We know you, you, you know what's going on. Um, when can you start? And that's when I realized that the book made all the difference. So no matter how credentialed you are, there are other people in your town, other people in your industry who have the exact same credentials. When you have a book, you stand out. That's why uh, I wrote books. And that's, if you look at this picture, I wrote all those books. Uh, in fact, Publicity Builder is actually a software program. My book was turned into a software program. <laughs> and some of these books are actually translated into Spanish and Portuguese, Chinese, Korean, uh, six languages in all. There's German. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Uh, when you write a book, it can open up incredible doors. I wrote one of the first books about marketing on the internet back in 1994. And that book was translated into several languages and it led to speaking engagements for me all around the world, from Beijing to Budapest, all across Canada. In fact, I spoke in Canada and Vancouver three times in one year and I can give you restaurant recommendations, Roger. <laughs> so, <laughs> love Canada. So all over Canada, the United States, and uh, even Brazil and Mexico. I taught the first internet marketing class at Berkeley in their extension division, that's the adult ed uh, professional division, and also an internet branding class at Stanford. So uh, I have a big background in the internet and all because of a book. A book started and that led me onto bigger and better things as it will, will to you.
So why must you write a book? Well, Mark Faust says a book is the golden key that helps you enter the executive suite. So it really does break through the barriers. It gets through the gatekeepers. It sets you apart from other people. Roger, I can hear you writing in the background. Uh, nope, so please nope. mute yourself. Thank you. Nope. No, not me. I'm not writing. Okay. Someone who's writing, uh, Roger, you might want to mute people. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there are marketing benefits to writing a book. You stand out. You can sell more products at higher prices as well because you're justifying your prices because you're the person who wrote the book. You're not just anyone. You're the person who wrote the book. So the book can actually build a brand for you and position you for a lifetime. Uh, there was a woman named Susan Roan who wrote a book called How to Work a Room. And uh, that book has been constantly published for 30 years. That's right, 30 years. It's been republished, reprinted, updated. There's audiobook versions and she goes around uh, the world speaking about how to mingle, how to network, how to work at parties and uh, business networking and such like that. It made her, it made, it made her entire career. But a book can do more than just that. My friend Alexandra Watkins wrote a book called Hello, My Name is Awesome, How to Create Brand Names That Stick. She's a naming expert. She names businesses. She names products. But she has a very unique way of doing it because she does not work with medical companies. She does not believe in the AstraZeneca, Propecia, words that are hard to pronounce, impossible to spell, and sound like they're Greek gods or Latin gods, or, you know, just, you know, just uh, words you, you can't even begin to pronounce. She has another way of looking at the world. She has a, a, a formula called SMILE, and the S-M-I-L-E stand for different parts of her formula. We don't need to get into it now, but she wants to put a smile on people's faces when they see her products. So she created the Baconator for, was that Wendy's or for Burger King, whatever, you know, she created the Baconator and many other products. Uh, there's a yogurt company called Spoon Me, and they sell more of the products, you know, like thongs and t-shirts and uh, spoons and cups and whatever, because it's a cool idea. They sell lots of those things. They also sell yogurt. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. Um, she named a face cream, Kiss My Face. And I see it at the checkout counters in my supermarkets all the time. You know, it's, 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 it's an evergreen product. It keeps on selling because it has a great name. Is it any better than anything else? I don't know, but it has a wonderful name. It brings a smile to people's faces. And those are the kinds of companies that she wants to work with. So she wrote the book because she used to have to explain to clients or prospects what I did and how I did it. Now, when people read the book, they're pre-sold. They know how she works. And if they're working for a drug company where they want to come up with a name that people can't pronounce or spell, then they're not going to work with her. If people read the book and they say, hey, we want to create a brand around something that's fun and interesting and compelling, then we want to work with Alexandra. So that's why she wrote the book. And it's a great way to save time on prospecting because now you're not having to explain how you do what you do. You're not having to explain and, and rather deal with people who just don't get you. And you deal with the people who do get you because after all, life is short. We should work with people and companies that we understand and that get us and we like to work with them and they like to work with us. So that's what a book can do for you. Here's another uh, book that actually helped uh, ghostwrite. Uh, Eric Rodriguez is a certified financial planner and he uses his book to qualify prospects. And his acronym is Henry's, H-E-N-R-Y-S. That stands for high earners, not rich yet. So uh, in other words, people in their 20s and 30s who are in sales uh, have big upward potential, but they haven't saved the money. They haven't gotten the compound interest yet. And uh, that's fine. So he uses the book uh, to figure out how to qualify his prospects. But he also wants the kind of prospects who are going to give him control of their money and let it sit and grow. 
He doesn't want the day traders and people are going to call him up five times a day and say, you know, what are my stocks doing? And, you know, what do you think about this stock? Should I buy it? You know, that just takes too much time. It's not a good use of his time and he can decide who he wants to work with. So he wrote this book uh, and it was a very, frankly, it was a very easy book to write. And here's a hint for you. He gave me a PowerPoint presentation with his uh, standard speech and was called retire, R-E-T-I-R-E. And the R H letter stood for something else, like the I stood for investments, and the T stood for taxes and whatever. So he had his act together. And you very well might have your act together as well. You might have done PowerPoints or podcasts or other uh, created content in other ways. So you actually have content that you can draw from, and it might even be enough for a book. Uh, it might not be, uh, but you might have a running start. So isn't that cool? So uh, definitely think that uh you can use your book to decide who you want to work with so they get to know like and trust you and obviously the reason you want to write a book is to get more clients and i interviewed this guy jim care on my podcast and he has this great closing line that he uses in all of his business presentations he says do you want to hire the guy who read the book or do you want to hire the guy who wrote the book <laughs> and i just love that i think that's very clever very unique, and it really presents you as a category of one that makes you really stand out from other people. So there are also, also there are personal benefits. When you write a book, you get focused. You know, you write a first draft and then you rewrite the first draft. And I'm not saying you have to rewrite the first draft a lot of times, but the more you write, the more focused you get. Uh, I'm working with one client now. I'm his developmental editor. That means uh, I help him with the big picture. And he's actually writing three books in one, which is a bad thing. You know, he's writing a personal memoir. He's writing a sales training book. But the book really is a book to teach programmers how to develop uh, personal charisma skills so they can get along better with people in the workplace. But he had this incredible urge to write those other two books because he wanted his son to know about his life, like a memoir. And all of his life stories were about sales training. So he wrote a sales book. So it was like, we have to cut away all this stuff to get to the essence of this book, which is another story for another time. But the point is, the more you write, the more focused you get on your message, the more clear you become, the more solid, the more uh, the visible your ideas become. So writing is a good thing. Rewriting is even better because you get more clarity. And let's not overlook one other idea ego. Uh, some people write the book to become famous. Uh, some people just become famous because they've written a book. And we're not talking about Kim Kardashian fame or political fame. We're talking about fame in your industry. Uh, people see your book and then they think that you're a celebrity in their industry. People ask you to autograph their books and treat you like a rock star. In fact, let me go back and tell you a story about the first book I wrote, How to Publicize High-Tech Products and Services. Uh, I was still doing PR at the time, and Macworld Magazine was having an editor's day. Now, an editor's day is where they bring in uh, software companies and hardware companies and their PR people like me, and we do demos for all the editors, and the editors get an idea of what uh, new products are coming around, and they can decide what to write, what to review. They get to know the executives on a personal basis. It's a really good thing. And one of the best parts about this editor's day is the buffet lunch because the, the these people are also advertisers. These 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 hardware and software companies are the ones who are going to buy multi thousand dollar advertising. So they want to treat them right. So the food is always good. So here I was standing on the buffet line waiting for my turn, and the guy in front of me turns around and he says, "What do you do?" And I said, "Well, I do PR, but I wrote this book." And he said, "What's it called?" I said, "How to publicize high tech products and services." He said, oh, great. How much does it cost? I said, $49.95. said, oh, well, how much does it cost you to produce? I said, $6. He said, oh, okay, I'll take a thousand of them at $7. And I said, who are you? He said, well, I'm the publisher of Macworld Magazine. And I want to use your book as an advertising premium, you know, a gift. So our ad people can go into people's offices and say, hey, here's a gift for you. Um, let's talk about advertising. So, so we bought a that, and I thought to myself, well, if I move a thousand copies of my book, I'll make a thousand dollars right there. I'll get a thousand copies out of my garage, which is always a good thing. And I could use that money for whatever. So I figured like that was a, was actually a good deal. 
But what I didn't realize is that when he gave the book to a thousand different high tech companies, they gave the book from their advertising department. They said, they said, it's a PR book. It's a publicity book. Let's give it to our publicity department. So now a thousand publicity departments in Silicon Valley had my book. And as it turns out, whenever they hired someone new, they gave them my book to read on the first day and said, read this book, come back tomorrow, and then we'll start working. So I would go walk through the halls of computer trade shows and people would come up to me and say, oh my gosh, I read your book. How do they know it was my book? My picture was on the cover. So there's another hint for you. Put your picture on the cover because your book is the best business card you will ever have because no one ever throws out a book. They'll take the book, they'll put the book on their shelf. Maybe they'll read it, maybe they won't read it. We hope they'll read it. Um, but even if they read the front cover and the back cover, now they, they, they know who you are, they know what you do. They've seen testimonials about about your service and how people like you. And then one day, it could be next week, it could be next month, it could be next year. They said, oh, we have this problem. And I, I remember meeting this guy at this trade show or at this networking event or at this speech and I have a copy of his book. And I think I had a blue cover, what was it called? I don't remember his name. I know it's somewhere here on my bookshelf. It's like, oh, there it is, bingo. Now you get hired. Uh, so a book is a great way to stay top of mind for people so they get to hire you. Ben, would you like to take a couple of questions? Sure, that's great. Uh, let's do it. All right. How do I get an outline for my book? Is having one a best way to write one? Uh, having an outline is a great way to write a book. Um, I'm going to go more into that on a future slide. So uh, hold your horses. But yes, when you have an outline, you will never have writer's block. And I'll go more into more detail later. Thank you. Second question. Do you think proposals work? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, I think proposals work because they really help you create a business plan for your book. They help you get focused and centered. So I think it's a really good idea that, that for you to have a, a proposal that answers basic questions like, who is the book for? How will they benefit? How will they be transformed? Uh, how is this book different from other books on the market? Why are you the right person to write this book? And how are you going to sell this book? So what is the marketing plan for the book? That's really what the proposal is all about. It's the marketing plan for the book. So what I say was a good thing and a bad thing. Well, if you're trying to go to a traditional publisher, they will want you to have a proposal, uh, but traditional publishing has changed. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that in our slide deck, but uh, to answer it quickly, publishers basically, how do I put this politely? Um, they have something called the shared risk model right now. Uh, what by shared risk, they mean they want you to buy 5,000 copies of the book at $7 a piece. Uh, so they don't have any risk. Why it's called shared risk, I don't know because you're taking all the risk. Uh, publishers today, unless you have a gigantic following, and I mean gigantic, well over 100,000 uh, people on your mailing list, uh, the ability to get on television and radio, the ability to do podcasts or TED Talks, the ability to speak to lots and lots of corporations. Uh, they just don't think you're going to sell a lot of books. And they, they're they in the business selling lots and lots of books. 10, 15, 20 years ago, they were willing to take a chance on an unknown person who had a small uh, following because you never know what can happen. Maybe the book is just needs to be written and they wanted to create books and help books that needed to be written and to make the world a better place. That world does not exist anymore in the publishing industry. It's all about the bottom line and dollars and cents. So if you have hundreds of thousands of followers, you're going to make a lot of money for them and they're happy to work with you and give you an advance and uh, maybe even help promote the book, although most publishers don't do a whole lot to promote books. Uh, so this is really turning into a discussion about self-publishing versus going traditional publishing. And I'm not sure if you want to go there, but when you self-publish, you have control over your book. Your book can be pub You can write your book in four to four months, five months. It takes two to three months to copy edit the book and lay out the book and actually do the production of the book. 
So in six or seven or eight months, you can actually have a book that you can sell on your website or sell when you speak or sell when you, uh, whenever. If you, go, if you were so lucky to have a traditional publisher publish your book, it could probably take at least one year and probably closer to two years to get your book into production because that's the way they work. They're much slower. They work a year ahead. They have publishing catalogs. The only books that seem to break out of that mold are say political books, which are more timely, but otherwise traditional self-help books, how-to books, business books, nonfiction books, generally take a year or two to get into the catalog and into distribution. So if you want the book to be a big business card for you, you're better off self-publishing because you'll get it out the door a lot faster. Plus, you'll get to keep all the money. If you work with a traditional publisher, they generally get to keep 50% of the cover price of the book. And of that 50% that they keep, I'm using round numbers, you might get 10 or 15% as a royalty. So you might make $1.50 a book as opposed to selling the book yourself at any price you want, $10, $20, $3 as a Kindle book, whatever, it's totally up to you. So I hope that answers your question, maybe in a little bit more detail than you thought. Uh, if, you want to ask, if you want to ask a follow-up question, feel free. Uh, you can find book proposal templates online just by going to Google and look for book proposal templates. You might want a nonfiction book uh, template and uh, there are a couple, one that I would recommend, I know there are books about this as well, but um, a platform, what's his name, platform, uh, Michael, Michael, who runs platform, I'm blanking on his last name, he has written an excellent template for book proposals. So if you look for platform.com, and Michael, whose last name I can't remember, probably has resources on his page for writing a great proposal, follow it, there are a couple of other versions that are that are good as well. Um, there's no traditional one way to write the proposal, but uh, if you follow his example, you'll be doing it the right way. I hope that answers your question. Roger, do we have other questions? Yes. Uh, how to maintain copyright to avoid what happened in your case, or do you really want to restrict this access? Well, copyright is simple. I don't know how it works in Canada, but in the United States, we have the patent office, copyright office, and you just simply go to their website, fill out a very simple form, pay them $35 US, and you own the copyright. I don't know how it works in Canada, but I assume that it'd be relatively the same. And then you own the copyright. No further questions. Back to you, Dan. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Do ask questions at any time. Again, I'm here for you. Whatever questions you want, uh, I'm happy to answer if I know them. So, there we go. So here are the myths. And, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people over the years, and it seems I have the same questions that people have the same myths that are holding them back from writing a book. So I want to go through a, a couple of the more popular questions here. And I call them myths because a lot of times the, their questions really are fallacies and they are uh, lies that people tell themselves so they don't have to write a book or they talk themselves out of writing a book. So let's go through a few of those now. And again, do ask questions in the chat to Roger and Roger, especially if you have a question about that particular slide, then Roger will uh, jump in and we can answer it. So it's very organized. And if you have a question that it just pops into your mind about marketing a book or whatever about a book that doesn't relate to that slide, we'll hold that to uh, a, a, a couple of times in the presentation that I've set aside for answering those random questions. So any question is good. So thank you much. Okay, myth number seven, you have to be a celebrity or famous to write a book. So here's a celebrity, a celebrity like Harvey McKay. And you know he became a celebrity because he wrote a book, uh, but that's really a myth. You don't have to be famous to write a book. In fact, if you go to Barnes and Noble, I know you have Barnes and Noble, you're sure you have Barnes and Noble in Canada, but the other bookstores as well. If you go into any major bookstore, near the front of the bookstore, they will have a, a set of books on a uh, stand that are the hardcover value fiction, two for $10. These are all the former best sellers. There's Janet Ivanovich and Lee Child and Brad Taylor and uh, CJ Box. These people are true, honest to goodness, New York Times best-selling authors. They sell tens of thousands of books, but after a while, they don't sell any books. And that's when the bookstore say, we got to get rid of these books. And that's when they go on sale for peanuts. In fact, my local library, they sell books 
uh, that are donated, or maybe they bought extra copies of books that were popular at the time, and then a few years later, they're not so popular. They'll sell them for 50 cents, 10 cents, a dollar, um, you know, just trying to get rid of books. So the minute you stop marketing a book is the minute the book dies. So as uh, entrepreneurs, let that be a warning to you. You have to constantly market your book. It's great to have the book launch. It's great to have book parties when it comes out. But the minute you take your foot off the gas pedal and you stop marketing your book is the day that your sales will die. And frankly, no one cares if your book came out last month or last year or three years ago, as long as the content is evergreen, of course. They just know that they have a problem and that your book can help them solve the problem. That's the only reason why anyone buys a book or reads a book is to solve a problem. So if your book solves a problem, that's the key thing. And they don't care if you're a celebrity, they just care that you have the know-how to solve their problem. Here's myth number six. A major publisher has to publish my book. Well, I think earlier, just a few minutes ago, I totally dispelled the idea of working with a big publisher because all the odds are stacked in their favor. They basically want you to buy the book uh, and pay for all the production of the book. Uh, and that's just crazy. So I strongly urge you that self-publishing is totally legitimate. Maybe years ago, five, 10 years ago, there was a stigma against self-publishing. And certainly 20, 30 years ago, there was definitely a stigma against uh, this vanity publishing. That's what it was called back then, vanity publishing. And those publishers were really rip-off artists. They wouldn't proofread the book. They just take what you have, put it in a book form, charge you a fortune, and you try to sell it. It was, it was a rip-off. Now there are... Self-publishing is totally legitimate. There are hybrid publishers who actually will do a good deal of the, of the production work for you. Some of them will give you an advance. Some of them will split their proceeds with you 50-50. They have all different business models. And you know that can be a fine way to work. My latest book, Write Your Book in a Flash, was actually published by a hybrid publisher. Why did I go with them since I'm this marvelous marketing person, you ask? Well, it's always nice to have uh, two people or a company behind you that will help do the work. But also they picked up all the expenses for proofreading, copy editing, layout, interior layout, cover design, back cover design, uploading to Amazon, formatting for Kindle, formatting for print books, and probably 600 other things that I just didn't want to get involved in. So yes, you can self-publish. There are a number of steps involved. There are books out there, there are PDFs, there are all sorts of checklists that you can get for free or for very low cost on Amazon. Uh, a lot of ghost, a lot of production houses will actually have little checklists for you that you can actually look at and say, well, I can do this, I can do this, I can farm this out, whatever. So um, there are ways to self-publish. It's totally legitimate today. You'll be good to, you, your book will be on the market faster. You'll make more money. And it doesn't cost you nearly as much as you think. The production could cost, say, between five and seven thousand dollars U.S., uh, as opposed to the thirty-five thousand dollars that a major publisher would want to charge you. So those are some numbers to consider. Okay, myth number five. I don't would you like know. Adam, would you like another question? I would love another question. Uh, if I self-publish, can I still promote my book at major retailers like Barnes and Noble and Amazon? Uh, definitely at Amazon. Amazon loves self-publishers. They love your promotion. Uh, if you go to kdp.com, kindledirectpublishing.com, kdp.com, you'll see amazingly simple tutorials on how to uh, make your book ready for Amazon. Uh, they have proofreading services. They have copy editing services. They have design cover services. Uh, all probably cheaper for the five to seven thousand dollars that I mentioned before. I'm not sure their exact prices. Uh, the quality is okay. I think when you go to a company that charges five to seven thousand dollars, you get a higher level of service and quality. But I know people who publish with KDP and with Amazon, and it's 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 it can be good enough, shall we say? Uh, if you can hire your own cover designer. So you have better control of the cover. That might be a way to go as well. You can find great cover designers at fiverr.com. That's F-I-V-E-R-R.com. There are talented artists literally all over the world who can design a book cover for $50 US. Uh, and you can see examples of their work. So if you're looking for something that has a, you, know, you, 
you can, you can send them examples of things you like, and then they can bid on your project and you can see if they have done other books like that. So you can narrow your search down and find people who, who are, who, who you think can do the job. So very inexpensive to do it that way. Um, Roger, can you repeat the question? Cause I'm missing part of it, please. Uh, if I uh, self-publish, can I still promote my book at major retailers like Barnes and Noble and Amazon? Okay, major retailers. That could be a little bit trickier because major retailers like to order from central distribution points. That way they get one invoice from the major distributors instead of hundreds of invoices from people just like us. So if you can get a distribution deal through a distribution house or through one of these hybrid publishers, then that would open the bookstores to you. You can also sell your book to libraries. Uh, so that might be something you haven't thought about. Libraries buy lots of books, self-published books. Again, if your book can answer a person's questions and solve their problems, then libraries want to buy your books as well. So keep those questions coming. A question hey. from Dylan. Is oh, great, the, more questions. Is the trend still with hard copies or is, I think he means hard yeah. paperback uh, or is publishing more digital platforms, ebook, question mark? Uh, yes, all of the above and add Audible for audio books as well. Uh, audible books or audio books, spoken word books are probably the fastest growing part of the marketplace. So when you write your book, consider hiring someone to narrate it for you. Amazon also has a narration and audiobook uh, service. It's called acx.com. And you can put your book up there and uh, narrators can bid on your project or, or not bid, what's the word? Audition for your project. And you can do a revenue split where uh, Audible gets a certain percentage and then you and your voiceover artists get another percentage. But the beauty of this is that there's no out of pocket because uh, you're putting your book up there. They're investing their time and their energy to create the audiobook, which frankly is a lot of work and a lot of time. And they might have to rent a studio and pay a studio to actually uh, record it, use their equipment and do editing. It's a big job. So you'd, you'd split the money 50-50 after Audible takes their, their cut. Um, to go to your main question, are ebooks popular? Yes, ebooks are very popular, but let's face it, different people have different modalities. Uh, uh, some people like to read books on a screen. Some people like uh, uh, soft cover books that they can take and read in bed, read on the bus. You know, just uh, some people like the feel of a book. I certainly like a feel of a book. But here's the, here's the real secret here: you can get a hardcover book with a paper flyleaf cover, with gold embossing, with your picture on it for about two and a half dollars US. The company is Bang Publishing. They're here in Minnesota. I'm not an affiliate. I don't get any money from them. <laughs> they don't know I'm alive. Um, but I've had a lot of clients go to them and they've been delighted with the work. That is as cheap as you can get a book published. If you go to Amazon, they will charge you two and a half dollars to print your book and then another two dollars to send the book to you. So, so it's amazing that you can get a hardcover book that really positions you as an expert, a book that you're proud to actually hand to someone at a networking event uh, and they feel like they're getting, wow, this is a hardcover book. This, this person must really be serious. So I know you asked your question from one point of view, like which is more popular. I'm answering it from a slightly different point of view. If you're using your book as a big business card to build your brand, to show people that you are credible, then you can get a hardcover book with the flyleaf, with the gold embossing that makes it look like a, the, the best publishing house in the world printed your book and people who get it will be like really impressed. Uh, granted, they would be impressed with a soft cover book as well because people are impressed by seeing an author. But when they get a hard cover book, that's the gold standard. So there you go. You can get a hard cover book for less than you thought. Thank you, Dan. So I have a question on that, a follow-up question on that. Do you have to order a minimum quantity and have a garage to store your boxes of books? Uh, yes, probably. I don't know their ordering details. You'd have to go to their website. And you know their website is sort of like a sandwich shop. 
Uh, you know, do you want meat with that? Do you want cheese? What kind of cheese? What kind of bread? Do you want it toasted? Do you want uh, lettuce on that? Do you want the onions? Do you want the pickles? In other words, when you order a book, there are different levels of quality of paper. There are different trim sizes, you know, five by eight, six by or six by nine, uh, even loose leaf size, you know, uh, eight and a half by 11. All those factor into the things. So the quality of the paper, how soon you need it, whatever. So all those factor into the price as well. So um, yeah, and the more you order, the lower the price will be. Uh, if you order from Amazon, it's different. Amazon printing, remember we're talking soft cover printing or talking Kindle. The soft cover printing are print on demand. That means that Amazon has the digital file copy of your book and it's just sitting there on a computer and they get an order and then they it, the order, <laughs> it, it, they flip a switch and suddenly they, your book is printed and it gets shipped out you know, in 24 hours. It's, it's amazing. Technology is wonderful. So Amazon does not have 5,000 copies of your book. Amazon will not ask you to print 500 or, five, or 50 or 5,000 copies of your book. They will just say, uh, thank you for sending us your book. Uh, we ran it against our computer. It seems like all the margins are set properly <laughs> and that you've uh, complied with all of our publishing requirements. So whenever anyone orders a book, we'll be happy to sell it for you and print it and ship it. And we'll sell it at the price that you recommended. And we'll take a certain percentage as our cut and we'll give you the balance. So that's how Amazon publishing works. Great, no further questions. Uh, Dan, back to you. Okay, great, myth number five. I don't know what to write about. Oh, that's fair. Uh, I find there are two kinds of clients or prospects. One who honestly don't know what they want to write about and the others who have uh, five books that they want to write and turn it into a major motion picture screenplay. It seems like no one is in the middle. <laughs> uh, here's what you want to write about. If you're writing a book to get business, you want to write about the problems that your key prospects have. Let me break that down. The only reason why anyone will read a book is to solve their problems. Now your book doesn't have to solve, uh, so let, me, let me rephrase this. And this goes to the outlining question. I think a book today that wants to be read has to be about 20,000 to 25,000 words. And that's about um, as much time as it takes to read the book from getting on a plane in Toronto and finishing it by the time you land in Vancouver. And I mentioned this to someone on a previous podcast and they said, I disagree with you. I think they should finish the book by the time they fly over Calgary. So that shows you about the tension span that people have today. People don't want a long book. They want a book that answers their questions, that solves their problems. So I like to have a book that has 10 chapters. The middle eight chapters talk about the eight problems that you like to solve. Now I can solve 20 problems. 12 of those problems I am bored to death with. 12 of those problems don't make me any money. 12 of those problems attract the worst possible clients. Do you see where I'm going with this? So don't write about problems that you don't want to solve. Write about the problems that you love solving, that energize you, that uh, your ideal clients have, and your ideal clients have tons of money to solve these problems. That would be the sweet spot. So how do you find out what those problems are? Ask them. Ask them. Um, do surveys. Call them on the phone. You probably have uh, questions that people ask you all the time. That's what people want to know about. That's what the middle eight chapters are. Those are the chapters where people get to know, like, and trust you, where they see you as the trusted leader who led other companies from mess to success. That's what those middle chapters do. Now, the first chapter tells them who you are, shows you your signature story, so they get to know, like, and trust you on that level, and it lays a roadmap out for the book. So they get to see that this book is for them, how they'll be transformed. Some of these questions uh, I answered in the, what, what should be in a proposal? What is the book about? Who is it for? How will they be transformed? Why are you the right person to write this book? How does this book differ from the other books? And also your signature story that shows uh, why you're so passionate about solving these problems and working with clients like them. And then maybe a roadmap for the rest of the book. That's optional. Okay. Then you have the eight chapters that solve their problems. 
And the last chapter is your call to action chapter. Because let's face it, if you don't tell people that you can coach, consult, speak, or help them uh, in a further way, you're doing them a disservice. You need to let them know that you can actually work with them on Zoom or come in and work with them on site or distance or speak at their conferences if that's what you do. Whatever your deliverable is, we have courses, whatever, let them know about that in the last chapter because now they know, like, and trust you. They know that you could lead them from mess to success. And they're saying, all this stuff is really good, but our business is different. <laughs> so um, we have this little nick here. And uh, the only way we can solve this is by bringing you in to help us. So you need to let them know that you can help them because otherwise they think you're just an author. They don't know that you can actually coach and speak and consult and do other, all those other great things. So myth number five, I don't know what to write about. I think by now you do know what to write about or you know how to find out what to write about. Myth number four, I don't have anything new to say. This is sort of like the self-defeating kind of image that some people have. This is where the imposter syndrome comes in, where people say, oh, you know, Professor Smith at Harvard knows more about this. And Professor Jones at McGill knows more about this than I do. What could I possibly say? Well, you're the only one who has your stories and your perspectives. Your material is different and it needs to be heard. And here's the other cool thing. Um, I actually got this from a book that I read a few weeks ago and it changed my perspective immediately. Judy Carter, who writes uh, comedy material, wrote, wrote a book about how to write a speech. But what she wrote about the speech was, was so applicable to people who write books. She said, you've already spoken your speech. You've told your friends, your colleagues, your families, all of your stories, all of your ideas, all of your theories, all of your funny lines, all of your jokes, all of your anecdotes. You've told them all that. You just haven't put it together in the form of a speech. And I'm here to say that you probably have done the same thing with your book. You've probably written articles and blogs. You've done PowerPoints like this. You've appeared on podcasts or TED Talks. You've done other presentations for community groups or such like that. You've told people your ideas. You know, in the, Before we started, one of the people on the call was a very passionate about her subject, about health and wellness. You know, She's spoken her book. <laughs> now let's get it on paper. So all you have to do is write. So you do have something new to say. The world needs to hear you. And frankly, let's say you're doing a book on selling. There are a million books on selling. There are a million books on leadership. But let's say that you have an expertise in selling uh, art supplies. Well, that's a whole lot different than selling McDonald's hamburgers or Tim Horton's donuts or something like that. And that's perfectly fine too. I'm not downplaying donuts or hamburgers or anything else, but it's a different kind of selling. So your expertise in that narrow niche sets you apart from everyone else. That's why you have something new to say. Myth number three, I don't know how to market a book to get business. Well, I'm gonna teach you how to do that right now. Now, there are two ways to do this. Here's the wrong way. It's called the hope strategy. I hope someone goes to the bookstore. I hope someone goes to the section where my book is housed. I hope someone actually sees my book with a spine out among all the 50 or 100 other books on the shelf. I hope they pick it up. I hope they look at the front cover. I hope they look at the back cover. I hope they actually see something that stimulates them to actually buy the book. Then I hope they actually read the book. I hope they actually see the information where they can contact me. I hope they can contact me. That's a lot of hoping. And if your book is not in a bookstore, you can say the same thing about, gee, I hope they go to Amazon. I hope they find my book. I hope they see my book from all the other books that are in my topic. Hope, 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 hope. Here's what you do to get business from a book. You figure out who you want to work with. Maybe you see their name in the local newspaper. Maybe you met them at a trade show or a, or a networking event. Maybe you were read about them or saw them on television. Uh, maybe you just heard something through Grapevine that this company has a problem and you can help them solve it. Great. Take a copy of your book, send it to them, you know, overnight it to them uh, with a cover letter that says, hey, I just heard that you have a problem with employee engagement or with uh, whatever your issue happens to be. Well, I addressed that in chapter four and I showed you how I, fit, how I uh, solved this with, a, with this company. Why don't you take a look at that chapter and then I'll call you and see if I can work with you uh, and solve it for you. That's how you get business with a book. You're not hoping anymore. You're targeting, you're specific, you're strategic in making it work. 
Okay. Uh, and here's a quote that will help you understand this. You attract prospects with general advice. That's in the book. The book is general advice and you get paid the big bucks for the specifics. That's where they say, yeah, we're, we're selling art supplies and you talk about uh, that wonderfully in your book, but we also have yarn. And you know, a lot of your book talks about paint and whatever. We have yarn. Um, can you help us sell more yarn? And you say, well, of course I can. And then you come in there and you do your proposal and you get hired. So that's how you turn uh, your book into business. Myth number two, I don't write well. Well, that may be a, a, a myth, it may not be a myth. I mean, some people lack confidence. Some people had their third grade teacher mark up one of their essays and they've never gotten over it. I can understand that. Some people have dyslexia. Um, some people have ADHD or other limitations. Uh, that's perfectly acceptable. But frankly, that's what copy editors are for. You can make those kinds of grammatical mistakes and copy editors and proofreaders, those are the people who you bring in to make sure that your grammar is correct, that your punctuation is correct, and that you can uh, write your book. In fact, uh, I interviewed this woman on my podcast and she wrote her book. I love this. She wrote her book. She dictated her book. She didn't write her book. She dictated her book while she was stuck in traffic on the New Jersey Turnpike. So if she can write a book, you can write a book. Uh, you can dictate a book. You can hire a ghostwriter to write your book. There are many, many ways to write your book, even if you do not write well. And here's the final myth. I don't have time to write a book. Well, this is the biggest myth of all. This is the biggest self-defeating myth, and I'm going to bust it right here. Remember how I said that books today don't have to be 300 and 400 pages long. They don't, people don't want to read a book that long. They want to read a short book, and a short book is 20 to 25,000 words. Well, I'm here to tell you that if you write 15 minutes a day, you will probably be able to write a book in four months. Here's the math. If you write 15 minutes a day, you can probably write 250 words. In four days, that's a thousand words. Do the math. Uh, in 20 weeks, you write 20,000 words, you're done. 20 weeks is five months. Okay, five months. I was a little bit off of my me measuring there. But chances are, once you get started, once you set 15 minutes aside to write a book, that's like, uh, you'll, it just revs your engines. Your timer will go off at the 15 minute mark and you say, I can write a lot more. So you write a lot more, you write until you're done. And that way you've written well more than 250 words. You might've written 500 words or a thousand words or maybe even more, I don't know. But you'll, you'll, you'll be able to write your book that way. So where are you gonna find that 15 minutes? Because the next problem that people have when they talk to me is they say, well, you know, I have kids, I have work, I have commuting, I have this, I have that. Well, frankly, if, you get, if, you're gonna, if you wanna make excuses, you'll find any excuse that works. Um, but you can wake up 15 minutes earlier. You can go to sleep 15 minutes later. You can take 15 minutes from your lunch hour. You take the kids to the soccer practice. Well, you can take 15 minutes and write your book while you're in the stands or in the car and they're off playing. Um, so you can find that 15 minutes if you really want to write a book. And if you're not gonna write your, if you're not gonna spend 15 minutes, then don't lie to yourself. I mean, you can see my guitars in the background. I, I spend 15 minutes a day playing the guitar. So I say, if I spend 15 minutes a day playing the guitar, then maybe I'll actually become a good guitar player one day. But if I don't pick up the guitar every day, if I don't practice for 15 minutes, then I'm only lying to myself. So don't lie to yourself. And writing your book and doing those 15 minutes, is sort of like doing sit-ups. You know, the first one's a pain in the butt. You know, just getting on the floor and getting mentally conditioned to do it is a big problem. But once you do the first one, the second one's a bit easier. And the third one comes without any problems. Then you're into four, five, and six, and you're sort of in a flow. And then I don't know about you, but you hit a certain point somewhere down the line. It could be 10 push, 10 sit-ups, 20 sit-ups. For me, it's 30. When I hit 30, it's like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't get to that 30th point unless I started with the first one. So writing is the same way. Start with the first one, and then you won't have any problems. So uh, this is our time for questions. Roger, do you have questions? There are no questions typed in the chat, Dan, so back to you. Okay. Well, actually, I have a question. Sure. 20,000 word book. How many pages is that? That would be about 120 pages, which is thick enough 
for a spine that can have your name and title printed on it. I know that from personal experience because I wrote a 96 page book and it was too thin. The spine was too thin to print my name in the title. Big mistake. So um, if your book is a little bit shorter, you can always add blank pages and use those as you know note pages or something. You can, uh, I'm not saying you should pay out a book, but if you're close, uh, you definitely need to have about 120 pages. I don't think that's gonna be a problem for most people. They generally write too much. <laughs> so 20 to 25,000 words, you're in a sweet spot. You'll be able to do well there. Question from Matt. Thank you for your answering my question. Question from Matt. How do you find a good topic for the book? How do you find a good topic for the book? You ask your potential audiences what the problems are. That's how you find the content for your book. So if you're in leadership, obviously your topic is leadership. If you're in sales, then your, your topic is sales. If you're in health and wellness, then it's health and wellness. So uh, that would be the way to do it. And to find competitive information, you just go to Amazon and look for other books that compete with yours. And you'll see the categories that they're in. You'll see what they cover. You might find competitive information. In fact, if you read the reviews, you might find what people like about the book and what people wish the book had. In fact, I tell my clients to read the three-star reviews. Now the five-star reviews are gonna be like, oh, this is wonderful. Uh, well, those are your friends. <laughs> you know, they're gonna say the book is wonderful. The four-star reviews are for people who said, I just can't give five stars to anything. But the three star and the ones, one and two stars are just haters. You know, these are people who just find nitpicks. They want to find something wrong. But the people who have three star reviews are the ones who say, I really like this book, but I wish they talked more about how to sell yarn at art craft stores. You say, hmm, let's talk about yarn or um, let's do fitness, but they don't address fitness for women who just had babies. Hmm, okay, let's focus on women who just had babies. So that way you can find some ideas for what the market actually wants. So I hope that answers your question. And second, another question, when or how do you define the title? Oh, wow, that's a great, great question. Um, your title will always be in flux. So start with the title and uh, as you write your book, other ideas will come to, to your, to, to your to your head um wow um uh, how to is always a good title those always sell look to see what other people in your genre are calling their books like in the self-help field it seems like every book that comes out today starts with the letter f and can't be pronounced on uh on podcasts and such like that beats me um so that's one way another way Frankly, and I love this, uh, a woman named Sam Horn came up with a great way of naming books. And she looked to people who had hobbies and, in, and found a way to work their hobbies into their book titles and the chapters as well, so they would stand out. So she was working with a financial planner. And uh, instead of calling your book like retire or whatever, uh, she said, you know, uh, what, what golf, what, what do you like to do? And she said, well, I like to play golf. So, okay, what golf terms relate to personal finance? And there's, you know, getting a mulligan. Well, if you start too late in uh, investing for your retirement, you can get a mulligan if you start putting more money into your retirement account. Bingo. Uh, so those were some of her chapter titles. And she picked the best of the, of the lot as the name for her book. I don't remember the title of it. Uh, but I had another client who was writing a book about how nonprofits can hire new board members, you know, real exciting. And I said, well, how can we dress this up? How can we make this more interesting? I said, what are your hobbies? And she said, well, I'd like to dance. So we played around with dancing terms. And the title of her book was The Nonprofit Hiring Tango. And the sub headline or the, the second deck was, I lead, you follow, we make beautiful music together. So it showed her personality. And some of the chapter titles uh, instead of, you know, the interview, it was the audition. Instead of uh, the first day at work, it was called opening night. So a lot of personality. So think about your hobbies and things you like to do. And maybe that will give you some ideas on making the title a little bit jazzier and a little bit more personal. And, uh, and it might make it, uh, so that might help. So there are a couple of different ways to name books. And how do you figure out the best title? Ask your prospects. 
So you can use Facebook, you can use LinkedIn and just say, hey, I'm writing a book about this topic. Here are three ideas for book uh, titles. Which one do you like, A, B, or C? Don't ask them to explain why um, and just see what people say. You'd be amazed. You know, the marketplace is never wrong. Uh, so that's one way. Those are several ways to title a book and to find out the best title for your book. Roger, do we have any other questions? Question from Matt. Is it better to have a book that's factual or exciting slash hypothetical? Uh, well, you should all, all books should always be factual. Um, if you're talking about a business fable book, those are very popular where you have a uh, idea that uh, your content is told in a storybook format so that story didn't really happen, but it explains all of your business processes and the, your target market gets to see themselves in that book. In fact, uh, Danny Inney, who's in Montreal and is a wonderful, wonderful, uh, probably the best course creator around, uh, sent me his book the other day. And it's a business fable about a woman who wants to start her own business, but she goes through all these trials and tribulations, goes down a lot of the wrong holes, like a lot of us have done. And then finally decides to like, oh, I can teach people how to uh, be a parent and uh, on the first month and take care of a baby during the first month of babydom and create a course around that. And it's a very good book told in a, a fictional format. So, so that's fine. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Uh, I, if you're talking about making up case studies and hypotheticals, you can probably do some of that, but the more realistic things you have, the better. And of course, some of you have case studies where your clients do not want their names used. So you can, you know, just say, Joan, not her real name, so I had this issue, blah, 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 blah. You know, so this company called me in and you don't name the name of the company. So, you know, don't ever lie. Uh, I don't think you were saying that. Um, but yeah, uh, the more factual, the better. If you can have case studies uh, that from your own personal use, that's fine. If you can point to studies from universities or think tanks, and believe me, you can go to Google and find hundreds of <laughs> studies on anything. I was uh, uh, ghostwriting a book for a woman, uh, a leadership book, and we needed uh, a study on employee engagement. So I went to Google and I found so many studies on employee engagement. I could prove anything I wanted to. And also when you use these studies, they have charts and graphs, which are also great to put into a book because they break up all those walls of black ink on white background. So you want to have illustrations in your book and charts and graphics and things that appeal to the eye to make it more, uh, more visual and more appealing. So there we go. No Great. further questions, Dan. Great, then let's go to the fast action step number one. Use the right formula. And actually I've gone through this before. Uh, your executive summary. I've, I've, it's so important to answer these questions in your own mind and put these on paper because if you don't know the answers, then you're gonna be writing a book that is so unfocused you're gonna have a hard time writing the book. If you can answer these four questions, you're gonna write your book a lot faster. So number one, who is the reader and be ultra, ultra specific. In fact, one of my clients now, we call this the avatar formula. Uh, you might've heard this in marketing. And that's where you actually picture the person. What are their demographics? What are their psychographics? So what do they earn? How much do they make? Uh, what are their uh, physical, what are their characteristics? Uh, I'll give you an example. One of my clients is writing a book for programmers on how they can have more charisma and develop communication skills uh, so they can get along better in the workplace and get promoted because in technology, uh, you can be the smartest person in the room technically, technologically wise, but if you don't have people skills, you're not going to be promoted. So that's who he wants to reach. So I said, let's be ultra specific about that. Think about who your person is. What are their demographics? What are their psychographics? What turns them on? What are their problems? Whatever. So he thought about that. And the next week in our next coaching session, he came back to me and said, my perfect avatar is Raj from the Big Bang Theory. Remember the programmer uh, from India who couldn't talk to women unless he had a drink? Uh, you know? uh, so I said, great, print out a picture of Raj, put it next to your computer. Now you know who you're, you are writing for. And I think that's really important because the biggest mistake you can say is, that, is to say, my book is for everyone. My book can help everyone because everyone needs whatever. 
Well, you don't have enough money in the world to market to everyone. And frankly, people don't want a book that's for everyone. They want a book that's for themselves, for their specific situation. So the more focused you are, the more your target reader is going to say, she gets me, he gets me, they understand me. Uh, not like these generic books. These, this person really, really gets me. So the more specific you are, the better. And frankly, that's how your book is going to stand out from all the generic books that are out there. So question number two, how will they be transformed? You know, I used to say, how will they benefit from your book? You know, as marketers, we talk about features and benefits. That's cool. No, people want to be transformed. They want to go from, you know, being overweight to being thin. They want to go from being, you know, a slob to being athletic. They want to go from being a lousy leader to being an inspiring leader. How are they going to be transformed? Think about that. So it's not like, uh, what are the features and benefits of this book? Oh, the book has 20,000 words. It has 10 chapters. It has a number of case studies. It has cartoons and what, no. How will they be transformed? So how is this book different? That's where you go into Amazon and do the research that I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, check out the best-selling books, see what's being written about them, see the reviews, see what's lacking, see what's missing. That's where your opportunity is. Uh, and also your niche makes your book different as well. Uh, four, why are you the right person to write this book? That's where your personal characteristics come in. Um, so again, if you answer those questions, that way, we'll, the fourth question will actually pump you up. You say, I can write this book because I have, you know, seven years of experience in this. I'm in the president's club. I've done this. I've helped people. People told me they've benefited from my, from my work. You know, those are the things I'm looking for that will pump you up and inspire you to want you to write the book. The second fast action step, you have all these materials already all around you. You've written articles, blogs, you've been interviewed on podcasts, you've conducted webinars, you've done sales presentations, maybe you have frequently asked questions on your, on your website. Uh, that's where you can gather your own internal material. You can use Google to find studies and other materials. You can look at competitor sites and see what information they have as well. Although frankly, I'm going to take that back. I don't like looking at competitor sites because I don't want to ever be accused of stealing their material, even subconsciously. Uh, I don't want their ideas to enter into my mind at all. So I really don't look at competitor sites. So strat I don't know why I said that. It's not on the slide. It came in my brain. Don't do that. Um, even if they really have, do have good information, you don't want to duplicate that. Uh, if you happen to have the same ideas as they do, by coincidence, that's fine, but you'll never be in the embarrassing position of saying, that's my idea. She stole that idea from my website. And you say, and all honestly, I never went to your website. I don't know what it looks like. It's my idea. We just happen to have the same ideas. And frankly, lots of people have the same ideas. Okay, step number three, work with the team to create your book uh, that saves time and you do it right. And that way you get a book that represents you well. You don't have to write a book by yourself. You know, as entrepreneurs, we can, we can do it all. But I think we've all read in many articles. We've all been to many podcasts that say you need to offload the work that you can't do, won't do, uh, aren't skilled at, and someone else can do better. That's how the whole virtual assistant revolution took place. Why do $10 an hour work when you're getting paid $100 or $200 an hour? Find someone to do the filing and the shopping for you and other things that that just don't work for you. And this is actually an endorsed by Ken Blanchard. Uh, he wrote The One Minute Manager and other books. Uh, he sold literally millions and millions, tens of millions of books. And he said, I went up to him at a conference one time. I said, why do you work with other people? You know, you're a brilliant guy. You can write your own books yourself. And he said, I learn when I work with a co-author. I thought that was very nice. It was very humble. And it showed that, you know, the book writing really is a team effort. So um, I work as a book coach and a developmental editor. Frankly, I don't know where book coaching stops and developmental editing begins, but uh, a book at a developmental editor is the expert who guides you through the writing and publishing process, you know, answering questions like I'm doing here. Uh, and one of the interesting things that people say, well, they're copy editors, there are proofreaders, and now you're telling me about a developmental editor. What's, what's, what's that about? What do they do? Well, imagine you're in a green room 
you know, going on television. And I know many of you have not been on television, but you've probably seen TV shows and movies where people are sitting in a green room about to go on TV. So you can picture that. And, you know, you're sitting in the makeup chair and this woman comes by and they're like, you know, uh, putting powder on your face and making you look good. And now that's the, the, the copy editor. So they're looking at the spelling and the typos and the grammar and the punctuation and all that good stuff. And then a few minutes before you go on the air, another woman comes by, you know, she's the proofreader and she's like dusting you with little powders and stuff to, you know, get rid of the little wrinkles and get rid of the little sweat lines and whatever to make it perfect. And that's the proofreader. And they're making sure there are periods at the end of sentences. They're making sure if you say, when I, as I mentioned in chapter six, they're going back to chapter six and making sure you actually mention that in chapter six, you know, all the fine tuning stuff that would drive you crazy. So, that's what the proofreader and the copy editor do. They're doing the, the typos and all that good stuff. So now you're perfectly groomed to go on television. You walk from the green room, you're about to go on the television set, you see all the bright lights and the cameras and such, and you say to yourself, what the heck am I gonna say? Well, that's where the developmental editor comes in. <laughs> you want that developmental editor to come in at the early stage to make sure that you know what you're going to say, you have your bullet points down, you have your chapter points down, you know the stories you're going to tell, you know the points you want to make. And that's what the developmental editor does. So a developmental editor sees what you don't see. They find the diamonds in the rough. You know, uh, I used to be a newspaper reporter and editor, and I'm trained for that. I, uh, it's so often that people bury their signature stories in the middle of the book. And I say, hey, wait a second, this is a great story you should really be at the front of the book. And they say, oh, wow, I didn't realize that. For example, I was working on a self-help book with a woman who was writing a self-help book for women between the ages of 35 and 50. Remember that specifics. Uh, and women between the age of 35 and 50 whose children no longer need them. And you're saying, how can that possibly be? Children always need their mothers. Well, when they're six years old, they're like, mommy, come here. Mommy, help me. Mommy, I need you. When they're 16 years old, they're like, mom, leave me alone. Mom, give me some space. Mom, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Okay, now you know who our audience is. Well, in the middle of chapter three, she had a, a, a story that had the subhead uh, that, uh, that said, excuse me for being gross. And it went something like this. I have this earthworm emerging from my belly. It's about a quarter inch wide and three inches long. It's my stretch mark. It shows that I bore four children, gained 180 pounds, and lost all but 20 of those pounds, and I'll probably never lose those last 20. But I wear that stretch mark as a badge of honor because it showed that I bore four great kids who are going to make a difference in this world. I said, Amber, that's your signature story. You're burying this story in the middle of the book. This has to be right up front so all your target audience can see you and see themselves in you and say, I had that stretch mark too, and I can't lose that 20 pounds either. So they relate to you because of that 20 pounds. And frankly, you know, even the book isn't for guys, guys can't lose those 20 pounds either. So she agreed, we moved the book to the, that, that story to the front of the book. And then I had this epiphany and I said, you know, the title of your book now is something dumb and boring. Um, I didn't say that out loud, but the title of her book was something dumb and boring. So someone asked a question before about, you know, how do you title a book? And I said, it's constantly evolving. Well, I said, Amber, what better title for a book that talks to women about going beyond their boundaries and going beyond their goals than stretch marks? And that became the title of her book. And the subhead was something that talked more about how busy women can cope in today's crazy busy world or something like that. You can find it on Amazon. And uh, the cover picture was of this uh, white uh, sheet and people were pulling at it from four different corners. Those were her four sons and her husband who's a professional photographer took the picture. So it was a very personal cover. So basically I created a brand for her based on her own story that she had buried in the middle of the book. So that's what a good developmental editor can do. They can see the diamonds in the rough and help you figure things out. Uh, another way that 
uh, developmental editors help is that they bring order out of chaos. You might have a million ideas and just not know where to go. And the developmental editor comes in and says, hey, you've written three books here, two of which are not <laughs> relevant to this book. Let's cut out these chapters that are totally irrelevant and stick with your main idea because you've really gone off topic. So you need someone who's firm, who you can trust, who you have good rapport with, and who has your best interests in mind. Uh, the coach also keeps you on track uh, because, well, the way I work with my clients is that every week uh, they commit to writing another chapter. And then the night before they send it to me. And there's something they need about deadlines that when you have a deadline, you'll stay up, <laughs> you'll do the work the night before. You know, you may put it off for several days, but if you have a deadline, you're going to do the work uh, and meet your deadline. So that's a way a coach keeps you on track. And they, they also tell you what you don't know, what you need to know. Like people asking questions say, lots of questions about self-publishing, about writing, about the business of publishing. You know, the coach will answer those questions and help you along the way. Uh, and also they help you through the inevitable downturns because you're gonna have incredible highs and you're gonna also have incredible lows. Uh, it just comes with the territory. One of my clients now is an NFL player. And uh, uh, then you really need to move towards closing remarks, please. I, I am, I am. Uh, uh, we have a coach here who says, uh, I know the value of coaching and as a professional football player, um, I needed a coach and Dan helped me for coaching. We had questions before. Some of you are wondering how you can help work with me. Uh, I can be your ghost writer. I can be your developmental editor. And the next step is to book a free 15 minute call with me. Roger, can you put the link in the chat room? Done. Okay, thank you very much. This is not a sales call. I would not try to sell you anything. Believe me, if there's a good fit, then we'll both know it. We'll wanna to work together. And if it's a bad fit, like a bad pair of shoes, neither one of us wants to buy a bad pair of shoes because they won't feel any better when you walk out of the store. So this is a call to see if I can help you. And if you think I can help you, then we should work together. So if you'd like to make that call or uh, have that 15 minute call, please click on that link. I'll be happy to chat with you. Roger, over to you. Great. And uh, Dan, you're a font of incredible wisdom about everything books. So on behalf of EIN 76,000 members, I uh, thank you very much for sharing this with us. Uh, thank you, it's been a pleasure being here. Participants, uh, reach out to Dan. Uh, there's a couple of questions that we can't, we don't have time to get to. Uh, so uh, use Dan's uh, link to reach out to him and ask your questions directly. Uh, that's all for now. Uh, again, Dan, thank you very, very much. You're welcome, thank you.